Hi everybody, it's uh, fantastic to have a chance to talk to you this evening about this important topic. Uh, so far in this series uh, we have looked at how we forgive and how we can live, lead a stress-free life. I hope that's going well for you all. And today we're going to look at justice. So what do we mean by justice? What ideas come into your mind when you think of the word justice? How about popping them down on the chat now um, and uh, yeah just pop in the first things that come into your mind when you think of justice and have to do a little bit of time travel here and uh, liaise with my uh, future self to try and work out what's what's being said but I can guess that probably um, people are writing down the word fair or fairness uh, if they're not then my future self will add it to the feed but this is quite a good way of summing up uh, what justice is all about. Now, the story goes that when my father was a child, um, he went to his grandmother and complained that such and such wasn't fair in the way that children do. And the grand Victorian lady turned to him and said, but God is not fair, dear. He is just. Now, if you remember one thing from this talk, please may not be that story. It's a little bit confusing, but it does serve to illustrate that a child's understanding of what is fair is not necessarily the same as an adult's. And likewise, sometimes the, our human understanding of what is just and what is fair is not the same as God's. And we'll discover this as we go on. But here is today's challenge. To truly see justice done, we must be committed to living a holistic lifestyle of justice. Or to put it another way, to truly see justice, uh, sorry, to truly see fairness done, we must be committed to living a holistic lifestyle of fairness. This talk is entitled How to Do Justice, but I would encourage us to think, how do we live justly? If we live justly, justice will flow from the Holy Spirit living in us to the world around us. And what does that look like? Well, we're going to look at three areas. How Jesus exposed injustice. How Jesus responded to the injustice that he saw around him. And how Jesus responded to the injustice carried out against him. Jesus never preached a three-point sermon about justice. And so much of what we know about his heart for justice, we gather from the way that he lived his life. But buckle up, because it isn't always very comfortable. Now I'm going to throw out some QR codes and websites during this talk, um, some web addresses and so forth. Uh, so you might want to have your phone ready to kind of zap the QR codes or take pictures of the websites or even have a pen and paper just to write some of this stuff down, because this is a really practical talk. Um, and there are things that you might want to follow up later. But let's start with uh, looking at the Bible. And we're going to be reading from the Passion Translation. Um, and we're going to start in John chapter 4 uh, from verse 3. Sorry, from verse 6. Wearied by his long journey, Jesus sat at the edge of Jacob's well. He sent his disciples into the village to buy food, for it was already afternoon. Soon a Samaritan woman came over to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink of water. Surprised, she said, why would a Jewish man ask a Samaritan woman for a drink of water? Jesus replied, if you only knew who I am and the gift God wants to give you, you'd ask me for a drink and I would give you living water. The woman replied, but sir, you don't even have a bucket and this well is very deep, so where... Do you find this living water? Do you really think that you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well and drank from it himself, along with his children and livestock? Jesus answered, if you drink from Jacob's well, you will be thirsty again and again. But if anyone drinks the living water I give them, they will never thirst again and will be forever satisfied. For when you drink wa the water I give you, it becomes a gushing fountain of the Holy Spirit, springing up and flooding you with endless life. The woman replied, let me drink that water so I'll never be thirsty again. 
and I won't have to come back here to drink water. Jesus said, go get your husband and bring him back here. But I'm not married, the woman answered. That's true, Jesus said, for you've had been married five times and now you're living with a man who's not your husband. You've told the truth. The woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me this, why do our fathers worship God here on this nearby mountain, but your people teach that Jerusalem is the place where we must worship, which is right? Jesus responded, believe me, dear woman, the time has come when you won't worship the father on the mountain nor in Jerusalem, but in your heart. Your people don't really know the one they worship. We Jews worship out of our experience, but it's from the Jews that salvation is made available. From here on, worshipping the Father will not be a matter of the right place, but with the right heart. For God is spirit, and he longs to have sincere worshippers who worship and adore him in the realm of the spirit and in truth. The woman said, this is also confusing, but I do know that the anointed one is coming, the true Messiah. And when he comes, he will tell us everything we need to know. Jesus said to her, you don't have to wait any longer. The anointed one is here speaking with you. I'm the one you're looking for. At that moment, the disciples returned and were stunned to see Jesus speaking with a Samaritan woman, yet none of them dared to ask him why or what they were discussing. All at once, a woman dropped her water jar and ran off to her village and told everyone, come and meet the man at the well who told me everything I've ever done. He could be the anointed one we've been waiting for. Hearing this, the people came streaming out of the village to go and see Jesus. Now, in many ways, I'm not a great person to be giving this talk. I'm white, I'm British, I'm middle class, and I'm male. I know many of my lifestyle choices and unconscious prejudices are unjust, but even if they weren't, who I am in the world's eyes, my characteristics, remind others of injustice committed against them. Let's think about some examples. Bear with me with this. I'm white and I'm British. That reminds uh, a lot of people, if, if they saw me and knew those characteristics, it could remind them of the slave trade. A slave trade that brought their ancestors halfway around the world and deposited, the, deposited them in places where they now live in desperate poverty and unjust situations. Not exclusively, but um, in, in a large number of cases. It could remind people of the British Empire, that their countries were once colonised and all the difficulties and baggage that comes with that. It could remind them of inequalities in British society. The reality is, is if you're a working class British boy or if you are a, uh, a person of colour, it's a lot harder to get on in life and that's not fair. I'm male and for many women who have been treated unjustly, just that very fact is enough to remind them of the injustice that they've suffered. You get the point. Jesus was a man, he was a religious teacher, and he was a Jew. To this woman at the well, he would have represented a number of injustices against her, even though this was their first meeting. Before we can think about how we can actively fight injustice, we need to recognise our part in it. And this starts with seeing ourselves as others see us. I love the book To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. For those of you who didn't read it at secondary school or haven't read it since, um, it's written from the perspective of Scout, who's a, a little girl growing up in the deep south of America during the Great Depression. And her father, Atticus, is a lawyer who takes on the case of, it's a hopeless case really, of a young black man who's been accused of the rape of a white girl. And Atticus gives Scout this advice. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb inside of his skin and walk around in it. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. And how do we do that? Well, let's look at Jesus. He built relationship. We need to talk to people. 
find people in your church and your community who are different to you and make friends with them. And that's a just act in itself. Then listen to their story. How have they or their people experienced injustice? Have you experienced in have they experienced injustice from you or from those like you? Alexander Venter was a young vineyard pastor in Johannesburg in the 1980s, and he was also teaching at a Bible college at the time. After a lecture one day, one of his students, Paul Matetti, uh, challenged him and asked, are you not just another white liberal, a hypocrite trying to patronise bl- blacks by saying nice words to us in front of the whites? If you mean what you say, then come to Soweto, which is a township on the edge of Johannesburg, and meet my friends and see how we live. Now, Alexander was very challenged by this, but also very scared. But anyway, he went along with Paul, and from that encounter, a multicultural church emerged, empowered, as he puts it, by a vision of the kingdom. It was built on the basis of personal relationships and storytelling, and it was a place where white people, black people, and people of uh, colour people um, worked together to heal their divides and to restore some level of justice in their relationships. And you can read more about the story and the really some really good practical examples and uh, sort of pointers uh, for people wanting to sort of go through this process in this book, Doing Reconciliation, In this, and you can uh, see it there on the slide. We need to, uh, to seek forgiveness in some cases, and if needed, correct our actions. As a son of God, I'm no different from Greeks, slaves, Jews, kings, queens, and I can walk in the forgiveness of that truth, free from any condemnation. This is not a guilt trip. But I still live in a world where the kingdom of God is still uh, being established, and I need to own my part in that story of bringing reconciliation. Jesus treated the woman at the well equally by being totally culturally taboo in talking to her in the first place and uh, and by dispelling the myth that only Jews would benefit from the coming Messiah. This little video gives a little insight into the lives of the Roma Gypsies in the UK. There's a mini revival going on amongst that group at the moment, which is incredibly exciting, but they're probably still one of the most uh, one of the groups in the country who received the most racist abuse. The lady interviewed and her husband are training to become Salvation Army pastors, having worked um, with their people uh, for for years in Christian ministry. Uh, When they're commissioned, they will pastor a white middle class church. It's a slightly funny way the Salvation Army works, Um, but they'll still be able to continue to support the ministry to their people. See if you can see how this lady might identify with the woman at the well. Hello, my name is Maria Karičkova, and I and my husband David, we are the second year cadet in William Booth College. At the moment, we live in London. I wanted to share with you the experience what I was facing in Czech Republic and in England as well. When I was a small child, I was facing the racism most of the time in school and in work. When our son, he started the first year of school, he was started to have it experience with racism as well. And that was the time when I realized I have to stop that and do something about this. I moved to England and I tried to always make sure my children, they not facing the racism in school and in the life. To live as Roma woman in Czech Republic is not easy. To be mum as Roma gypsy and living in Czech Republic is not easy. So many times I was have to explain to my children they are Roma and they are not accepted in society. Of course, in England, we have the racism as well. Just people, they deal in with that and they try to stop it. And that bring the peace to my heart. God bless you. Well, 
The second part of knowing our role in bringing justice is understanding the systems that we're part of that are unjust. I'm going to quickly raise a couple of areas. This is not an exhaustive list and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. It's definitely not designed to make anyone feel guilty. It is just simply the reality that our holistic approach to justice should not pick and choose um, what areas of our lives we decide to change and what areas we don't. So let's look at trade. Where our food comes and clothing comes from makes a massive difference to justice issues. As a nation, we're one of the top five for our power to purchase stuff. Now, it might be that you're listening to this talk and you really don't feel like you've got a lot of power to purchase stuff. In fact, just getting food onto the table is tricky. But for the rest of us, our purchasing choices make a real difference. Now, fair trade, you may have heard of fair trade. It's a little logo that you can get on um, on a number of products um, and it's not perfect, but it's a great place to start. Making sure that our coffee, tea, chocolate, bananas have not been picked by, by children is a complete no-brainer. And it doesn't have to cost a fortune. Aldi chocolate hoops that you might eat for your breakfast, they're now made with fair trade cocoa. And... Here is a, a the next slide shows a um, website that you can go to, which has responses from uh, most high street retailers um, about their supply chains and where they um, make their products and their relationship with companies in China. The environment. Our impact on the environment is pretty in your face at the moment, is it not? Our lifestyle in this country contributes to habitat loss and climate change, which has a disproportionate impact on those in the world who produce the least CO2. That really isn't fair. One example, the, the UK produces around 24 kilograms of electronic waste per person per year. And I'm pretty close to that, I reckon. The challenge for many of us in this country is how to live more simply, creating less consumables and less waste. There's so much information out there um, that I really won't go into now, but I would encourage you to sign up to the Arocha UK Wild Christian programme. If you want to join a community that's committed to making a difference in nature, you just get a monthly uh, newsletter with some great ideas about what you can do in your community and you can feed in stories. And yeah, it's just a great way. It's brilliant for kids too. Um, and there's some information on the slide here. There are, of course, a whole load of other areas where we need justice to reign in our lives, and it's a great area to pray about and to ask other people for their input. Our response to the injustice we are part of is a testimony to the transforming power of Jesus in us. So take encouragement from the words of Eugene Chu, who said, we need to pursue justice not just because the world is broken, but because we are broken. And what a message that could send to those around us. So what about tackling injustice we see around us? Well, Jesus was really radical, wasn't he? I mean, we have this image sometimes of this pan ten, softly spoken man in a white dress wandering around a sort of fairly sanitised uh, first century Palestine, but it's not very accurate. He was a guy who hung out with tax collectors and prostitutes and was not ashamed. Uh, he hung out with terrorists, but he healed the centurion's servant. He chatted with foreign women to the disgust of his own friends. He was aware of his status as a man, but never abused it, treating the vulnerable with gentleness, but getting really angry with those who abused the power that they had over them. So what can we learn from Jesus in this regard? Well, Jesus always held words and actions together. As he honoured sinful women in the presence of the religious elite, he righted the men's wrongs and told them of the kingdom of God. As we undercut power structures that promote injustice, we need to be ready to point to where the true power comes from, i.e. Jesus. He, he advocated for the oppressed. We see this in John chapter 8 with a woman who had been caught in adultery. He tackled the structures of oppression and injustice 
And we see this sort of outpouring of righteous anger as he turns over all the tables in the temple and he drove out the money lenders who are ripping off the poor. Like he kicked off big time and he was totally right to do so. We need to do the same. We can do this by a, a whole number of different ways, but we could, you know, the easiest perhaps is writing to our MP about justice issues or visiting him. And we'll hear a little bit later from Edward about, you know, the, the impact that this can have. It can mean standing up for someone at work, college, uni or school who's being unjustly treated. It could mean reaching out across the cultural and social divides, maybe racial divides in your community to try and bring some healing to the wounds that injustices have caused. Atticus again in To Kill a Mockingbird tells Scout as he's just, um, you know, stood up for somebody and he's about to take on this court case. He says, I wanted you to see what real courage is. Instead, the idea that courage is a man with a gun in his hand. It's when you know you're licked before you begin, but you begin anyway and you see it through no matter what. You rarely win, but sometimes you do. The difference here is that God does win and uh, as we'll see in a bit, the impossible becomes the, the the impossible becomes a possible in his kingdom. He demonstrated compassion in action. The parable of the Good Samaritan highlighted the importance of action. His feeding of the five thousand and the healing of the woman with bleeding, as well as multiple d disabled people, showed his readiness to back up the words that he spoke and the advocacy that he made on their behalf with restorative action. And we can take part in this too. It might be in the form of charity, uh, giving money to charities that uh, and organisations that that um, uh, deal with the causes and restore victims of injustice. It might mean giving our time to spend with the homeless on the streets of Winchester or in a night shelter or a refuge. It could take many forms, but can become part of this holistic lifestyle of justice that we're called to. Finally, he prayed. He prayed for his father's kingdom to come. Prayer is not the last resort when we can do nothing else. It is the most powerful weapon we have in the fight against injustice. Prayer also enables us to sustain this calling to live a holistic life of justice. Mother Teresa said, prayer makes your heart bigger until it is capable of containing the gift of God himself. Prayer begets faith, faith begets love, and love begets service on behalf of the poor. I'll just say it again. Prayer makes your heart bigger until it is capable of containing the gift of God himself. Prayer begets faith, faith begets love, and love begets service on behalf of the poor. Murray Williams said, prayer is at the core of the kingdom task of seeking justice. Prayer allows us to share our heart with God, but also to hear God's heart. And we've definitely found that as we've been praying for justice. And there are lots of opportunities to pray for injustice in this church. Uh, we're going to hear from Edward now about how all these things can come together through the lens of fighting injustice, the injustice of anti-trafficking. Hi. My name's Edward and together with my wife Catherine and uh, son William we've been part of uh, the anti-trafficking and justice prayer group probably from the beginning. We, uh, in those days, we, we prayed a lot and we, we hoped a lot and um, we saw a lot of changes and here's an example of one thing that happened uh, which was of huge encouragement. Um, uh, we, after one meeting we decided we do some practical things and we were assigned a task of contacting Steve Bryan, our local MP, to uh, talk with him at one of his clinics. Um, uh, well, at least I thought we were tasked with the thing of setting it up, but um, when the time came, our pastors were busy and uh, Catherine and I and William went to actually see him. Uh, we talked to him about uh, the whole process of uh, women caught in prostitution and possibly being trafficked. And uh, I said to him, could we play an eight minute track, uh, an interview? Uh, and he said, the time's your own. Well, 
Earlier on in the day, I've been praying, you know, should I talk statistics or should we? And I felt the Lord say, no, don't talk statistics, speak to his heart. So we played this eight minute interview, which was from Leila Micklethwaite of Exodus Cry, being interviewed by an Australian journalist about women caught in prostitution in Australia, which was a very similar situation to over here. Um, at the end of it, he was stunned into silence. Uh, we then got a conversation going, um, but really his heart had been moved and his, he, he had changed his views. He went on to join the Justice Committee in the House of Parliament and uh, to be an advocate for uh, women and uh, women caught in, in prostitution. So we're very thankful to God for, for this answered prayer. Um, uh, you never know how these things are going to go. So um, pray the impossible and uh, dream the impossible and see what God does. Um, thank you for listening. The last area we're going to look at is how Jesus responded to injustice against himself. And the answer is incredibly hard, but also incredibly simple. He turned the other cheek. Fast as he was to come to the defence of those around him who were unjustly treated, he was slow to come to his own defence. In fact, the oppressed around him repeatedly recognised injustice that was meted out on Jesus, yet he did little to protect himself. He sometimes walked away when that was the right thing to do. We live in a society that says you should stand up for your rights. Turning your cheek is completely countercultural. Now we're going to have a look at this picture. Now, many of you will have seen this picture. For those of you who haven't, you might already be getting some ideas of what it's about. It'll be interesting to see whether you're right. <laughs> Basically, what happened here was during the Black Lives Matter protests um, last year, uh, this white man found himself in the midst of the protesters and things were getting pretty ugly. Now, we don't know a lot about this, this white man. We don't know uh, exactly why he had turned up that day. Uh, we know a little bit about this background, that he had been a policeman. But as I was saying before, just his physical characteristics represented so much injustice to uh, the protesters. And for whatever reason, things were getting ugly. And this black man here, he realised that that was happening and he knew that he had to do something. So he picked up the man and his friends formed a shield around him and they marched that guy out and took him to safety. Now, he realised that despite the injustice caused against him, his responsibility in that case was to turn the other cheek and to act fairly, act justly and take that man to safety. I'm reluctant to tell you what this means for you, particularly if you're facing injustice or have faced injustice. This is between you and the Holy Spirit. But we have the perfect example in Jesus. So I just urge you to dig deep into the Gospels and see how he did it. And where does this leave us? Well, we're called to a holistic life of justice, regardless of whatever else we may have been called to. We're not all called to set up the next international justice mission. We're not all called to lead prayer meetings. But we are all called to live this holistic life of justice, whether we're pastors, mothers, business people, you know, politicians, wherever we're called. Jesus calls us to understand the injustice we cause or represent by the accident of birth, by our you know, characteristics. He tells us to repent and turn our back on injust systems we are part of. He calls us to stand up for those who are unjustly treated through our through our advocacy and through charity. And he calls us to turn the other cheek when confronted with injustice against us. Now, any of you wanting to look into this subject more, you know, it's an awful lot to cover in 25 minutes, um, but uh, there are some great resources. There's Alexander Fenter's book um, on re uh, doing reconciliation, which has sort of got some really good practical tips for how to take this forward. There's also this great tier fund resource, which I think has about eight studies on justice, looking at um, issues of poverty, issues of environment, um, what the biblical prophecies are around uh, justice 
And then it's got some great small group questions to work through afterwards. So brilliant one for life groups, brilliant one to get some friends around who want to explore this issue of justice. Uh, we're also hoping to put together some other, uh, another sort of video resource uh, looking into a particular instant where Jesus uh, reached out to a, a woman who had been unjustly treated. Uh, the story of the woman who washed Jesus's feet with her hair. And that is that is such a significant story. So we're hoping to put some resources together for that in the very near future. But for now, I'm going to hand you back to Nigel and Joe 